Welcome to the last session. Um, it is a sincere pleasure um, to introduce uh, Stefan Roth. Um, he is one of the outstanding figures in the computer vision community. He's been working on, on many things and um, very recently a lot on probabilistic models in the context of deep learning. Um, he will give a talk about um, robust scene analysis, energy-based models, deep learning, and something in between. So I think this will be extremely exciting because these are a few very concrete um, problems we have to address also in the context of robust vision. So I, I really look forward to seeing your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias, for the introduction. Thank you to the, uh, for the organizers uh, for having this wonderful workshop and inviting me here. Um, so uh, when I was invited, I was a bit unsure about what to talk about. Um, so I've, I've decided to give you a bit of a tour de force uh, uh, through a couple of things related to robustness. What I believe is related to robustness. We'll see if, if you agree. So first of all, uh, let's, uh, let me say what the context is. Uh, well, the robustness workshop isn't specifically focused on autonomous navigation, but this is at least one area where a lot of this is cropping up. And the Kitty benchmark was one of the uh, 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 one of the challenges that paved the way towards this workshop. And if we look at the disciplines that um, people participate in, uh, we can make out two groups. Uh, one is sort of I would roughly uh, describe as motion and geometry, and we've seen a lot of challenges this morning. And then we've also seen semantics just now, and we'll have a bit more after after this. So uh, I want to talk about these two things, but with a focus on on motion and and geometry. And one of the observations that we've seen throughout the day is that it continues to be a hard task, um, not only because you know, the imaging circumstances may be challenging with saturated areas and difficult lighting scenarios, but then we've seen bad weather, vision at night, and, and many other uh, scenarios where uh, we still have a lot of difficulties. When we switch to semantics, uh, uh, there's been significant progress, as, uh, as nicely uh, shown by Uwe Frank in his talk, pushed by data sets such as cityscapes, or more recently also the mapillary data set that we've just seen in the previous talk. Um, on the other hand, um, we've also seen that uh, these uh, approaches are not completely reliable yet. And for this reason, some people in the community have started working on um, ways of trying to figure out when algorithms are not reliable. And here's one such example, Bayesian Segnet from Kendall and colleagues, which other than uh, an estimate of the semantics that you see here in the top right, uh, also produces a map of the uncertainty. And so this is one of the things that I want to go for here. So um, let me start to give a bit of a, a high level view on this. So, so uh, when we talk about robust scene analysis, what do we mean? I, I think we have a few objectives and we're trying to make them uh, all uh, happen simultaneously. Uh, the one that we as community are often most interested in is accuracy, right? We want to push the, the, the numbers in terms of data mo error in, in motion recovery, geometry recovery, or uh, accuracy in terms of the semantics. Um, at the same time, we want it to be fast, right? And then also robust, and this is what this workshop is all about, right? But what does robustness really mean? Uh, what the, work the interpretation of robustness in the workshop um, is that you want to be robust to a variety of settings. That's why in all the competitions, we've seen a number of data sets that people need to participate in. But I would also argue, and this is a sentiment that a number of the previous speakers have also uh, shared, is that robustness means that an approach should know when and where it fails, okay? and when and where uh, it works. And so uh, for that, I want to um, uh, take motion estimation as a guiding example, and later I'm going to try to generalize this a little bit, and look at what two different families of approaches can learn from one another. Okay, so there's the classical energy minimization, which has dominated computer vision research uh, for uh, easily two decades now. Uh, and uh, so some of the benefits are that it's actually fairly accurate, right? We've seen a, st a statement earlier that, yeah, deep learning approaches perform uh, really great for, say, motion estimation. That's true, right? But actually, it turns out that model-based approaches aren't so far behind. Um, they have a big disadvantage, though. Um, they tend to be pretty slow. But they have a big advantage in terms of robustness. If you throw them at a new scenario, they tend to work OK, because they have only few parameters, so it's very hard to overfit them. Okay? So this is one of, the, one of the good things about them. If we contrast that with deep learning, um, the nice thing is that the accuracy is, is very high. Right? Uh, especially if we have a lot of in-domain training data, we can achieve unprecedented accuracy. 
uh, for example, also in motion estimation, and additionally, we get it really fast. On the other hand, we've also seen that in a number of talks earlier today, the robustness happens to be lacking to some extent anyway. So what I'm going to talk about uh, here are four different things. Uh, the first one I want to tell you a little bit about how we can boost the accuracy of classical energy minimization techniques. And now you may say, okay, I don't care about energy minimization anymore, this is old stuff. But um, one interesting takeaway from this is that we can use these uh, techniques and these insights to boost the robustness of deep learning based approaches, okay? In, in, in order to make them more uh, domain robust. And then the third thing I wanna talk about is robustness on the side of classical energy minimization again, where now I'm talking about robustness in the sense of the algorithm knowing when it works and when it doesn't. And finally, I want to uh, translate these insights back to the deep learning side and talk about when a deep network uh, or how a deep network might be able to assess whether the output is reliable. And that's then the only place I have to admit where I'm going to also talk about semantics. Uh, so I'll mostly talk about motion here, but at the very end, I'm going to say a little bit about semantics. So I'm trying to keep it a, a bit more open here. So uh, let me start with the first aspect, the accuracy of classical approaches. And what I want to talk about is work that uh, uh, together with my student, Jun Wahur, we presented at ICCV last year. And the basic idea is um, when we estimate motion, we haven't actually modeled all the important effects that we, that we observe. And in fact, one of the problem areas of current motion techniques are occlusion areas. So what we are trying to do in this approach is make occlusions integral part of the whole estimation process. And at the same time, we, uh, we, we are treating time not as uh, uh, one direction in which you always go, but we, 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 we uh, perform a bi-directional estimation, which turns out to be quite helpful. But let's take it step by step. So why occlusions? Um, well, occlusions, as I mentioned, are a key problem area of recent energy-based approaches to motion estimation, but not only, if we look at deep learning approaches, that's uh, where they tend to have problems as well. So why does this problem occur? Well, ultimately, occlusions are a consequence of motion, yet at the same time, um, uh, knowing the occlusions is important for estimating the optical flow well. So we have a chicken and egg problem, and uh, we don't really know how to get out of this, okay? So what does the literature do uh, to take care of this problem. Uh, so far, um, most approaches trying to avoid solving this problem directly. So they instead consider occlusions as outliers that violate the optical flow assumptions and then somehow try to minimize the effects from the outliers. So the way you do this is you use some robust matching term, for example, and then you do some post-processing. So here's how a classical pipeline would work. You take in your two images, you take an asymmetric optical flow algorithm that estimates the motion forward in time, and then you swap the order of the images, run the same algorithm again, and you get a flow backward in time. And then you check where, they two, where these two agree. And if they agree, then most likely you don't have an occlusion. If they don't agree, you might have an occlusion. And so you want to ignore that part. And so algorithms tend to interpolate that. But the problem here is that occlusion is sort of dealt with as a post hoc fact, right? When you estimate the flow in the first place, occlusion is not taken into account and you're only trying to uh, uh, remedy the problems later on. So what we're doing instead is we're trying to integrate the occlusion estimation directly into the algorithm. So we want to take into images, have a single approach that gives us optical flow and occlusions. And we're going to do that, as I mentioned, forward and backward in time. So we have forward motion, backward motion, and forward and backward occlusion maps. Okay? And so some of the key properties of this technique is that we can solve the dependency between motion and occlusion directly through an optimization framework. We don't need any more post-processing. Everything is done through a well-defined mathematical objective. And by looking at temporal sy symmetry, we can better describe the relationship between motion and uh, occlusions, as it turns out. So how do we do that? I only want to take a sort of a high-level view on this. Um, the basic idea is fairly simple. We borrow from the broad literature on motion estimation, which decomposes the scene as a set of superpixels and describes the motion in each superpixel as a local homography, okay? assuming or modeling the fact that the scene or motion is piecewise rigid. Okay? And then we define an energy, um, and that energy has two very classical ingredients, a data term that matches the appearance, we use a standard census transform. There's nothing particularly interesting about it. 
the only thing I should mention is that since we model occlusions, we have that information available, so we don't actually penalize uh, um, uh, uh, non-matching appearance in case of occlusions. Instead, we assess a certain constant penalty. And then we also have a standard smoothness term, again, nothing particular, except that we also model smoothness of occlusion maps. Why? Because we expect occlusion states to be co coherent in space. Okay, so, um, so that part is maybe not so interesting. What's more interesting are the things that we add on top of classical formulations. So the first one is that we integrate this, what's typically done separately in post-processing, this forward-backward consistency check into the objective. And the basic idea here is the following. Suppose we start at a particular pixel P in the first frame, and we now estimate the forward motion. We end up at a corresponding location P prime in the second frame. And from that frame, from that location P prime in the second frame, we can again go back to the first frame because there we have the reverse optical flow, the backward optical flow, since it's part of our state that we estimate. And now we can see whether these two are in disagreement. And if they are, then um, I want to penalize that. Okay, so we have a simple penalty that uh, basically looks at this distance here. And on top of that, because that alone wouldn't be enough to actually determine the occlusions, we directly couple occlusion variables and optical flow through what we call an occlusion-disocclusion symmetry term. Okay, and the basic insight here is the following. If you have an occlusion in one temporal direction, then you must have a disocclusion in the opposite temporal direction. Okay? Occlusions we model directly. These are just binary flags uh, uh, that we optimize over. And disocclusion we obtain implicitly from the flow, right? Because, uh, and the way we do this is that we check whether there is any other pixel in the other frame that maps to a particular location. And if not, then this pixel is becoming disoccluded. Okay? And so if, if, if disocclusion and occlusion in the forward backward time are inconsistent, then we penalize that. So what's the consequence of that for the results? Um, so here we have some results uh, on the KD2015 optical flow benchmark. In the leftmost column, we see the sparse ground truth. Then uh, the next two columns are the uh, color-coded flow for the forward and backward time direction. And here in the third and fourth column are then the estimated occlusion flags. And what you can see, for example, is that they nicely align with uh, the driving shadows, if you want to think of it, uh, of the vehicles that move through the scene, okay? And then we can also look at the accuracy numbers, and I don't want to dwell on the, the exact numbers too much. Uh, in fact, the table is probably, by, or is surely by now incomplete. This was a snapshot at the time when, when we uh, published the work. Um, and you can see that uh, in terms of overall accuracy, uh, the mirror flow uh, approach uh, 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 fares fairly well, and in fact, it even outperforms deep learning-based approaches, which might contradict the impression that, that you have looking at, at all the work in the community that deep learning is far ahead. This is true in many areas, but actually motion estimation happens to be one area where the difference is, is not very large, and in this case, maybe not even there at all. So the interesting thing is this very classical approach by combining motion and occlusion, so by describing the appearance model or the generative model in some sense more completely, we get significant accuracy improvements, especially in occluded areas. We get uh, very good results on public benchmarks. I've only shown Kitty here, but on Sintel it also works quite well. And we don't need any semantic knowledge uh, and we don't need any learning here. Nothing's learned, okay? So that may seem surprising. And you may ask, well, why do you want to do that? Um, Here's one answer. Um, we can use this to then also improve deep learning based approaches. Um, and one problem that we've seen in several of the talks today is that deep learning based approaches often tend to fit to the particularities of the domain. And um, one of, uh, I would say that we can actually use these model based approaches to remove some of the ill effects uh, of overfitting on a particular domain. So the second work that I want to talk about, uh, we call UNFLOW, Unsupervised Learning of Optical Flow. Um, and that's joint work with uh, two students, Simon Meister and Jun Wahoo, and we had this at AAAI earlier this year. So what's the, uh, what's the idea? As I mentioned, uh, we have a domain mismatch, and that domain mismatch is not only uh, uh, existent because we have data from all kinds of different domains, but in optical flow even more so because the training data is predominantly synthetic, because ground truth data uh, is, is very scarce. Yes, we have the Kitty data set, but um, quantitatively speaking, it's fairly small. So what almost all supervised optical flow networks do is that they train on synthetic data like you see here on the left. Yet when we evaluate our techniques, we apply them typically to real images like the ones you see here on the right. 
And um, it's no surprise that uh, there may be some difficulties, right? And we've seen this in, in some of the talks earlier. So what we want to do here is we want to take a standard uh, deep network for optical flow estimation, for example, the flow net by Dostoevsky uh, and colleagues. Um, uh, however, it's not limited to this particular network. We could also use a different one. Uh, and we don't want to assume any uh, ground truth flow given. Uh, instead, what we assume is that we only have uh, frame pairs from video. And the way we can learn from this is that we use these model-based approaches as proxies. And they give us then a loss function, basically, that we can optimize. So how does that work? Uh, as uh, uh, Jason, you and colleagues showed in 2016, uh, it's actually possible to train an optical flow network completely unsupervised or self-supervised, as, as it's also sometimes called, uh, in the following way. You take in the images, um, you feed them into a standard network, say FlowNet, you get out uh, a flow field, and then you backward warp the second image to the coordinate system of the first image. And then you compare uh, the, this warped image with the original input and see where they agree and where they disagree. Where they disagree, you apply some penalty. Um, and that allows you then to then ensure that your predictions allow to align the appearance of the images. Okay? Since that alone doesn't suffice, they also add a smoothness loss to make sure that the uh, optical flow map has the smoothness that we typically observe in real world scenes. And uh, that's then basically the whole loss. You simply use that to train a deep network and that works surprisingly well. However, what they used is a very simple model that we wouldn't consider state of the art anymore. It assumed brightness constancy, which is often uh, uh, violated in practice. It doesn't model occlusions and it also has a relatively simple smoothness term. So what we did is we took many of the advances that I mentioned in the previous part of the talk and applied them to this setting. So we estimated, uh, uh, we estimate not only uh, flow forward in time, but also backward in time. And for this, uh, we simply take the flow net and instantiate it a second time with shared weights so that we can estimate uh, flow in both temporal directions. So we get two flow fields and then we can look at the temporal consistency and um, penalize that uh, if it's inconsistent, just like in the previous talk, but now as a loss function. Okay. We also get occlusion flags out and they can be used to modulate the data loss uh, so that appearance mismatches are only penalized if the network can actually be expected to match the appearance. Okay. I'm going to skip uh, most of the details for that. You can refer to the paper, but it's basically a continuous adaptation of the previous method that, uh, that you've seen, but now used as a loss function uh, for a deep network. And now we can train this network. Um, we do this uh, initially on synthetic data um, to show that we don't actually need uh, uh, the typical data sets that, that people use to train uh, optical flow networks. We use a different one here, the Cynthia data set. And then we continue training on real sequences. And we've done that on the Kitty raw data, but uh, you're not necessarily limited uh, to the specific data set. So we don't need any specific data sets with optical flow ground truth, just video, okay? So how well does this work? Um, well, not as well as the state of the art, at least not in the simple, uh, incarna simplest incarnation, but uh, it actually uh, works fairly well and I'll have numbers later. But so here's a, a simple network and that's uh, not the final uh, network that we have on, a, on an image uh, on Kitty where this is the ground truth here. This is the predicted flow by the previous method, previous unsupervised learning method, which makes a lot of uh, relatively gross errors here on the road. Uh, whereas if you apply these uh, insights from the previous model-based approach to now unsupervised learning of a deep network, you can significantly reduce the error again. And this is all completely unsupervised, right? There is no supervised training data used here at all. If you use that to do fine tuning, then you can actually get fairly accurate results. Um, so uh, on, on the Kitty data set, um, uh, by modeling or by using this uh, more faithful model, we can actually reduce the average endpoint error and the outliers about 50% compared to previous unsupervised learning approaches. And the method also performs quite well. So for example, on Kitty, it's currently ranked uh, fifth among, un uh, among the published two frame methods and third among end-to-end -end deep learning methods. And that's despite the fact that uh, during most of the training, the model never saw any uh, ground truth supervision. Okay, so, so that's uh, the first part of my talk. Then the second part of my talk 
uh, I want to switch from domain robustness to this other issue or other notion of robustness that I've mentioned, that uh, we'd hope that models not only work well, but in the case where they don't work well, that we at least know when and where they do, don't work. Right? And so this is now uh, work with uh, my students Anne Wannenwetsch and Tobias Plötz, as well as Market Kolper from Mannheim. Um, uh, the principal work that I want to talk about here is this paper we call Prop Flow, Optical Flow with Uncertainties, which we had at ICCV, but we have a follow-up work at CVPR later uh, uh, this week, and I'm going to mention this uh, briefly. So the basic idea is the following. Um, uh, when we estimate flow or geometry or what have you, uh, the results are not going to be equally reliable over the image. In case of motion estimation, we all know that in homogeneous areas uh, with little texture, motion is harder to estimate than in areas that with highly and well-defined texture. Yet, if you have that information, it would actually be quite useful. And this is a point that Uwe Frank has also argued in, in his talk, because then in later stages in the processing pipeline, and optical flow, we should, uh, we should uh, of course, mention, uh, is never the end product. It's always an input for some other, uh, for some other vision processing step. Uh, if, if that step at least knew about the, uh, about the uncertainty of the previous stage, then we can actually exploit this. And I'll show later some results for motion segmentation. Now, so how do we do this? Um, so the first approach that I'm going to uh, show you applies to standard model-based approaches where we have an optical flow energy, such as the one that I've shown you earlier. So we want to, we, we, we're taking some images I in, we want to estimate the optical flow, and we have a data term and a, a smoothness term, just standard. If we have more advanced energies, we could deal with that as well, such as non-local terms. And so then we, what we want to do is we want to apply probabilistic inference to these energies, okay? And one of the principal challenges is that um, it's actually intractable, and so we need to make some approximations when we do this inference. In order to make these approximations doable, um, the first thing we're going to do is we'll reformulate these robust potential functions, uh, such as, for example, the Charbonnier penalty that's uh, frequently used, into a Gaussian scale mixture, okay? Because that allows us to retain explicit mixture variables that allow us to make the inference a little bit easier, okay? And so once we've slightly massage this energy, not very much, uh, we can interpret it as a probability distribution by simply invoking the Boltzmann uh, law or, or, uh, or, or the Gibbs distribution. So the, the posterior probability of our flow field is uh, uh, proportional to e to the minus the energy, okay? That's easy, right? We've seen that many times, but now we, ha we, are, we have that in a form where we can actually apply probabilistic inference. Uh, the, the challenging bit here now is that this posterior is very high dimensional and we can't directly work with it, so we need to make it uh, more tractable. And the way we do this is we apply a naive mean field uh, inference step. So we uh, fit a Gaussian distribution, I'm gonna call that Q, uh, with, uh, uh, which decomposes into the uncertainties of the different pixels. And uh, once we have that, we can then estimate the uncertainty as the entropy of that uh, approximate distribution, okay? So that's the high level sketch. Now the details, the mathematical details are, get a bit tedious, so that's why I don't wanna go into them. But there was one surprise uh, when we did this. Um, uh, well, maybe actually it is not a surprise, but um, uh, you can tell me later. So we thought, okay, mean field is a standard technique in machine learning, we can just apply it and it'll work, okay? But we found that it doesn't work. Um, and uh, then we thought about it again, and we realized maybe that's not so much of a surprise at all, because um, if we apply black box energy minimization to such an energy that we typically use to estimate motion, it won't work either. Right? People have designed custom optimization algorithms for flow for two decades, and they didn't do that because it was so much fun, because, but because it was a necessity. Okay? Otherwise, you don't get good results. And so what we found is that if we apply mean field in a black box fashion, it also won't work. But we can fix that by basically translating a lot of the algorithmical innovations that people did uh, uh, for energy minimization to the variational inference uh, uh, world. Um, more or less one-to-one, -one, and then it turns out that actually mean field works, okay? Now, uh, there's one problem, quote-unquote, with this. Um, it's a bit tedious, so you have to derive lots of uh, long equations and then implement them, and maybe you don't want to do that, okay? But 
we have a solution to that as well. Um, and I'm not going to say much more about it, but if you're interested, you can come to our poster uh, tomorrow. Um, uh, We've also shown that um, you can use um, uh, methods of, uh, from stochastic variational inference to estimate this uncertainty in practice. Uh, and the nice thing about this is that it's more or less black box. You just need the energy and a so-called linearization of this energy, and then you can apply a simple algorithmic recipe in order to not only get the optical flow, but also the uncertainty. Okay? So, what do you get out of this? Um, so here's uh, uh, an application now to show a different data set uh, for Sintel. Top row ground truth, middle flow estimate, and on the bottom you have the uncertainties, where blue means uh, highly certain, and the more reddish the color becomes, the higher the uncertainty is. Okay. So by the way, I haven't mentioned uh, what energy this is. We took a standard energy from the literature, the one from Epic Flow, which is also one of the relatively competitive energy-based uh, techniques for motion estimation. And uh, one thing that you can observe here is that, apart from the fact that the flow is fairly uh, estimated fairly well, you can see that the uncertainty agrees well with the error that the, the optical flow algorithm makes. So for example, uh, here in this region, um, uh, the ground truth is definitely uh, different from what the algorithm estimates, or I should say by, uh, other way around. And uh, the algorithm uh, knows that it's uncertain in this area, which is nice. Uh, over here also, we're making a mistake. Uh, the algorithm estimate is incorrect. And in fact, it, uh, um, the algorithm also knows that there might be something fishy here, okay? So this information can be quite useful. Um, and uh, uh, I'll show you an example of how we can exploit that in a second. So the takeaway message from this part is that if we apply probabilistic inference to standard energy minimization based formulations, we can get flow that's as good or even slightly better than the underlying standard technique, but we get uncertainties for free almost. Uh, yes, you need to spend a bit of computation time, but um, they turn out to be quite useful. So here's an example of how we can use them. Uh, here's an application to motion segmentation, where on the top you see motion segmentation purely based on uh, standard off-the-shelf optical flow. And on the bottom you see the motion segmentation based on the exact same optical flow energy, but with uncertainties attached. So we use this technique to estimate the uncertainty. And uh, we can then exploit, let me run this again, we can exploit this uncertainty to make the motion segmentation more robust. Okay? And there's really very little change other than the fact that we take this as an additional cue for the motion segmentation pipeline. And I hope you'd agree that it becomes a fair bit more reliable uh, by exploiting the uncertainty. Okay, so now, uh, but then you may say, okay, I don't have an energy-based model. Um, I have a deep network. Uh, and I want, still want to get uncertainties. So this is uh, now the fourth part of my talk, um, lightweight probabilistic networks. Uh, we have that coming up uh, as well uh, at the CVPR, and this is joint work with my student, Jochen Gast. And the basic idea is we don't just want to get an answer from a CNN, but we want to get an answer with an attached uncertainty. Okay, and here again, for an example in flow, uh, we want to get a mean prediction as well as a prediction of the uncertainty. And hopefully, and you can see this already as a preview here, it will agree well with uh, where the uh, model actually makes a mistake. Okay? So how can we go about this? Um, if we think of a standard feed-forward neural network, um, it just gives us a point estimate. So we take uh, a certain input at uh, at the beginning of our network, and then we go through the network at every point and uh, through the network we have an activation at just a single value, okay? And that's the case also at the output. But in reality, maybe there isn't just a single prediction that uh, we should make because that prediction may actually be wrong, right? And we want to know when that happens. And in fact, there's a fair number of uh, uncertainty sources that we have to cope with uh, in, uh, in, in our scene analysis tasks. And as Kendall and Gal have nicely analyzed this, uh, there's, for example, the aleatoric uncertainty, which is the noise from the input signal that affects all of our estimates. And then there's also inherent noise uh, to the model. Um, but that, unfortunately, turns out to be more difficult uh, to capture. Now, what can we do about this? Uh, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the most prominent solutions to this is test time dropout by Gal and Garamani. And the idea, that's also the idea behind the Bayesian segnet, is that you perform dropout not only during uh, training time, but also at test time. Uh, 
you run the same feed forward network multiple times, then you get different predictions and uh, where the variance of the predictions is high, you're probably pretty uncertain about them, okay? And that's a very nice method, uh, mathematically very well justified, but the problem is you have a significant slowdown because you need to run the network many times to get samples, maybe 50 or 100 times. And for real-time applications, that doesn't seem very practical, okay? So what we wanted to do is to get something even simpler uh, where we get uncertainty, but we have very little overhead. Uh, so we didn't want to spend a lot of extra computation. We didn't want to increase the memory consumption by all that much. And we also didn't want to spend engineering effort, right? We don't want to redesign all of our networks, but rather we'd like to take the networks that we have, make them probabilistic, um, and uh, get uncertainties out without doing much otherwise. Okay, but we also need to uh, keep it realistic and so for this reason we're going to limit ourselves to aleatoric uncertainty here because it turns out that saves memory which makes it more, more practical. And so then we uh, look at two different realizations. Um, the first one uh, we call Proba, it's really simple, uh, actually it turns out some other people independently had similar ideas. Uh, the, the basic uh, idea is that uh, instead of predicting a single value, say a motion or a semantic label, you predict a distribution over motions. And you do that uh, by basically outputting a probability distribution. But otherwise, in the other layers of the network, you keep everything as, as it would be. So you only need to change one layer in your network. So that's fairly simple. But it doesn't take into account of uh, uncertainty that may arise uh, as the network um, uh, refines its estimate. And so what we can also do is we can propagate aleatoric uncertainty all the way through the network. So we start with uncertain input. That uncertain input gives rise to an uncertain activation at the first layer and so on, all the way to an uncertain output. Okay? And the way we do this is uh, using assumed density filtering. And I'm going to say a little bit more uh, in a bit. Okay? So let me now try to uh, at least briefly sketch um, how this works. For more details, you're welcome to come to our poster. Um, uh, so if, uh, to just formalize what happens in a regular neural network, um, let's think of them as just a nested set of functions. We have some input, say an image or multiple images. We apply uh, some linear layer with some nonlinearity, and we continue doing that until we get some output. And every layer has some parameters, theta, uh, theta i, okay? And so now we're going to make this um, uh, into a probabilistic network. Um, the first thing we're going to do is, uh, as I mentioned, we're just going to replace the deterministic activations with a probability distribution at the output. And uh, uh, that can be done uh, if we restrict the output to be parametric. So think of it in the following way. As opposed to predicting, say, a particular motion vector for at a pixel, we predict a mean and a variance of that motion. Okay, so that's what I mean by outputting a probability distribution. Uh, but we're not restricted to particular probability distributions. You could choose any sort of domain-specific probability distribution that fits your application. And so the last layer in your network, as opposed to predict parameters uh, theta of that probability distribution. And that's a fairly straightforward change. We don't need to do, any, we don't need to do much to our well-established networks. Um, uh, just the last layer needs to be adapted slightly. So now, how do we solve concrete applications with this? Uh, so how about motion estimation? Um, uh, in motion estimation, we typically, or in many kind of dense prediction tasks, same for single image depth estimation, we tend to use LP type loss functions. Um, and it turns out that there is a probabilistic analog to it, the so-called power exponential distributions that I've given you here. And the basic idea is we can adjust the robustness with some exponent, and otherwise this very much resembles a standard Gaussian distribution, but it's more robust, okay? And so we can just uh, now predict the parameters, the mean and this variance parameter of this uh, power exponential distribution, and as training objective, we simply maximize the likelihood of our data under this a probabilistic model, okay? Fairly straightforward. All right, and, and, and it turns out we can also do this for classification, but I'm going to uh, uh, defer that to a little bit later. But let me first talk about how we might then uh, also go about propagating the uncertainty all the way through the network. So the basic idea at a very high level is the following. We assume that at each layer, we have an approximate Gaussian distribution of the intermediate activation Z. Okay, with some mean mu and some variance v. And we're going to fit this local approximation to these uh, activations now with an iterative scheme. 
That's called assumed density filtering. This is uh, in itself nothing new. It's a well-known technique from machine learning, but we apply this now to neural networks uh, in the following way. Um, at every intermediate layer, uh, we basically estimate the mean and the variance of the nonlinear activation function from the previous layer. Okay, And it turns out, uh, I'm not going to give you the details here, that for almost any standard component in the network, for convolutions, for ReLUs, for pooling operations, we can give probabilistic analogs uh, in closed form. So we have fairly limited uh, engineering overhead. We can just take our well-established networks, um, uh, say, take the ReLU and convert it to a probabilistic ReLU and otherwise go ahead uh, as, as usual. Okay. So what can we get out of this? Um, we can, for example, apply it to optical flow. Um, so here we've applied it to a standard flow net, but again, this would apply to similar networks in, 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 a, in, 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 in a straightforward fashion. The only thing we do is we replace the output with these power exponential units, and then we train using maximum conditional likelihood as opposed to the typical L1 type loss. And what we find is that the mean, actually, uh, mean prediction is competitive, and I'll give you some numbers in a second but that the predicted uncertainty is actually quite useful and it's highly correlated to the empirical endpoint error. So the nice thing is that by, by doing these fairly few changes to a standard network from the literature, we don't just get the same estimate or more or less the same estimate that we got before, but we also get the associated uncertainty. So at a particular place in the image, we know uh, uh, or we have at least some idea of whether we can trust uh, the result. So we can also make this a bit more quantitative. Uh, uh, I don't want to go into all the detailed numbers, but the, the takeaway message is that if we look at the endpoint error, the probabilistic variance uh, of the networks are more or less competitive with the standard network, uh, which is nice. So we don't actually lose anything in terms of accuracy. Okay? Um, but we get the uncertainty as an added benefit. But we also want to keep it practical, right? So it should be fast. So the standard flow net, at least in, in our PyTorch implementation, runs at 106 frames per second. Uh, if we applied uh, the um, test time dropout by uh, Gal and Garamani, this would go down to about three frames a second. So that's a, a bummer. That's why we uh, want to do something about it. Uh, and so with our ProBot network, we remain at about 101 frames per second, so very close to the original uh, speed. And if we apply assumed density filtering, meaning propagating the uncertainty all the way through the network, we're still at around 40 frames per second, so we have about a two and a half times uh, a runtime penalty. But still, uh, it's, still it's, it's fairly practical, I would argue. So how about the uncertainties? Um, uh, it turns out that they're actually fairly competitive as well. Um, uh, uh, these are log likelihoods, so higher is better. Uh, the, uh, in the third row here, we see the uncertainty from uh, the test time dropout, uh, so we're actually significantly better than that despite being faster. Uh, and here it turns out that there is a big gap between propagating the uncertainty all the way through the network uh, 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 with respect to es uh, establishing the uncertainty only at the output. If we uh, propagate the uncertainty all the way through the network, uh, the uncertainty is significantly uh, more reliable. Okay? And then we can also look at um, uh, what's the relationship between the predicted uncertainty and the actual error. And again, we find a nice correlation. So this uh, is a plot where uh, uh, on the x-axis we have the entropy of the predicted distribution. So um, uh, on, the, on the right, the uncertainty is higher. And um, uh, uh, on the y-axis, we have the average endpoint error. And we can clearly see that uh, where the uncertainty, the predicted uncertainty is high, these are also the regions where the algorithm or the network actually makes the biggest errors. So now I promised at, uh, that I would come back to semantics, and I'm going to do that uh, at the very end. It turns out we can apply the same methodology also to classification type problems. Um, the basic idea is, um, uh, well, you all know that the softmax already produces a distribution over classification labels, but it turns out in practice the softmax, the softmax probabilities are actually not well correlated with the true probabilities. And uh, uh, th so what we do about this is that we go, in some sense, one level above. We model this as a Dirichlet distribution, which is basically a distribution over multinomials. And, uh, in the network, we predict now the parameters of this Dirichlet distribution, in particular the mean and the concentration parameter of the Dirichlet. 
And uh, the mean comes out of a standard softmax, and the, cons uh, the concentration parameter basically comes out of the variances that we've estimated in the network. Okay. So uh, again, for details, I'm going to have to refer you to the poster. Let me briefly uh, uh, try to go through what the, what the potential benefits here are. Uh, we've applied this to some simple classification tasks, say SciFAR and MNIST, and what we find is that the predictive performance stays more or less the same. Um, it's sometimes a little bit better, sometimes it's a little bit worse. The important thing is you don't hurt the predictive performance of your model, but you get uncertainties out and they turn out to be uh, quite useful. Um, and one way they're useful is that they uh, seem to, and I don't have, I have to admit, a particularly good explanation for why this is the case, um, but they seem to increase significantly the robustness to adversarial attacks. Um, so uh, here we have uh, results from a standard white box uh, fast gradient sign attack. And if we look at different variants, uh, we find that um, the probabilistic networks um, here at the very bottom are significantly less affected uh, by these adversarial attacks. Presumably because they somehow took into account the uncertainty in the estimation process. But uh, as to what the details are, I think here more research is required. And again, finally to wrap up, uh, we find a nice uh, uh, correlation between the predicted uncertainty and the actual categorial uncertainty. Top is uh, with our probabilistic networks, below is what a normal softmax would give you. And uh, with our network, you get a much clearer and nicer correlation between actual uncertainties and predicted uncertainties. So I'm out of time, I need to wrap up. So let me try to conclude. Um, I talked about um, robust scene analysis, particular in the context of motion, but with an outlook on, on other domains like uh, classification. Um, and I argued that energy-based models and deep networks have a lot to learn from one another. Energy-based models can help deep networks to uh, improve robustness to domain shifts. And we can also borrow from the standard literature on probabilistic methods to make deep networks be aware of when and where they work. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Stefan, for the fantastic talk. I think this is really exciting. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. Great talk, thanks. Um, so I have a question regarding the last part. Mm -hmm. um, do you have an intuition, um, so regarding the probabilistic output layers versus the like fully probabilistic treatment, do you have an intuition why the uncertainty seems to be better calibrated for the fully probabilistic treatment? Because if I consider this potentially very complex representation system which a neural network represents um, like with all these nonlinearities, I should be able to represent a function um, that maps to directly maps to the mean and the variance uh, in a very calibrated way I would assume so somehow these intermediate layers seem to modify the network in a sense that make it more I don't know smooth or, or at least different from from uh, directly mapping to the um, parameters of the distribution Yes, so, so, so you're completely right in that, um, um, in, in principle, you could just have uh, the network um, learn all the required nonlinearities to be able to predict the mean and the variance. Um, one difference may arise in the fact that um, when we apply the assumed density filtering, the number of parameters stays exactly the same as for the classical network, whereas if we uh, predict mean and output only at the last layer, we have additional parameters in the last layer. I think that on, so you may have more of an overfitting effect potentially, uh, but I think more importantly, because uh, we, we already treat, uh, uh, well, um, there, there is conflicting evidence coming from many downstream sources. And I think be, uh, by, by being able to sort that out earlier in the network and, and, and know that we have larger variances in activations, that can help, that's, that's my intuition. Um, but uh, I, I think more introspection uh, into how, what exactly the different uh, activation probabilities at intermediate layers mean would be needed to, to, re to really answer your question. Okay, we have time for more questions. Uh, Stefan, beautiful work. Um, your ADF assumes that in addition to having the mean of each uh, activation, there's an independent variance, right? In theory, you could model the covariance structure in a whole layer, although that might become computationally prohibitive. 
Do you think there might be any advantage to modeling full covariance at each layer? Yeah, and that's a good question. Um, well, I, I think there definitely will be coral, highly coral, uh, high coral, strong correlations among different activations, which we're ignoring here. Um, I think memory-wise, it, it will probably be a, a problem, right? I mean, if you have millions of activations and if you want to have a complete covariance structure, that doesn't seem very feasible. But perhaps there is a low-rank approximation that, that one could do. Yeah. Uh, we haven't really thought about that, but uh, that might be interesting. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have time for another question. Actually, I got one question. <laughs> I actually got many, but... <laughs> um, so I'm very curious, like... How do you typically regularize the the probabilities, right? I mean, is there an intuition behind it? Do you think typically they're mostly Gaussian distributions, or um, so? So in this case, we, um, uh, for, for example, for the flow application. Oh, sorry, no, wrong direction. Um, no, where do I have it? Yeah, we assume that we have this power exponential distribution, um, and so uh, we don't need to do any specific regularization. We just take the log likelihood uh, under this probabilistic model and use that as the training objective. Um, so there aren't really many, many tuning knobs uh, that... that, that so, so you're not trying to minimize variance or something like that? No, I mean, the, the, the variance is basically dealt, dealt with implicitly in, in the following sense. Um, if, if the mean prediction is spot on, then it's okay to make the variance small. If the mean prediction is wrong, then this objective more or less tells you that you need to buy this problem with a high variance. And by, and by that, you implicitly learn the trade-off between mean and variance. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for, I think, a very fantastic talk. Um, let's thank the speaker. Thank you.